Agents of Mayhem was supposed to be the new intellectual property coming from Volition Games, makers of the Saints Row franchise. But interest in the game was short-lived. Review scores ranged from average to bad. The game was far from perfect, suffering from bugs and repetitive gameplay. But it was still functional and fun, boasting lots of campy cartoonish action. The game was not bad, it was just forgettable. Some reviewers describe it as something that could entertain you for our weekend but would forget about it afterwards. Given that the game was a big budget title, the lack of interest is perplexing. True, the marketing of the game was limited, but it did come from a well-known developer, the guys who made the infamous Saints Row franchise. Unfortunately, this could have been the reason for the lukewarm reception of the game. Agents of Mayhem suffered with its association to Saints Row because it created conflicting expectations, forced unsuited game modes, and did not allow the game to form its own identity. There is no doubt that Agents of Mayhem was trying to use the popularity of the Saints Row franchise to generate interest in the new IP. Gat was announced early as a downloadable character, a dominant color theme of the game was the Saints Row Purple, and the Saints Row Fleur de Lis was everywhere. Pierce and Oleg were added as playable characters as well. However, all the Saints Row imagery led people to believe that this was a sequel to Saints Row. Instead of attracting fans of the franchise, the game earned ire since the fans wanted the next Saints Row installment instead of a new IP. Reviewers also approached the game expecting it would be a spiritual successor to Saints Row. As such, while some reviewers criticized the game for relying on unfunny toilet humor, other reviewers criticized the game's writing for not being raunchy enough. In addition, the game confused some of the fans of the franchise. Many of them did not keep up with the Saints Row franchise up to Gat Out of Hell. As such, fans were confused to why Johnny Gat was in a game that did not feature the Third Row Saints. If the game was not trying to constantly remind you that it is associated with Saints Row, Gat's inclusion could have been associated as just a bonus. After all, he is a downloadable character. Bonus characters from other franchises are added all the time as DLC. It could have just been a happy surprise for longtime fans if they discover through the game's lore that it is connected to Get Out of Hell, continuing from one of the game's endings. But when the game has so much Saints Row iconography and characters, people started forming expectations for it. With the game riding on the popularity of Saints Row, the developers had to include Saints Row-like content to try and please the fans. Unfortunately, not only was this poorly implemented, it was not appropriate for the new IP. One of the most memorable moments in the game is watching all the characters enter a vehicle. It showcases the individual personality of the cast and highlights the lighthearted nature of the game. The actual driving, however, was clunky and forgettable. Most of the cars lacked personality which made the driving, racing, and car battle segments feel like a chore. Aggravating the problem is the lack of interesting places to drive to. The open world is tiny compared to other games. The setting of a high-tech soul was promising initially. However, the city felt very generic. There was the occasional odd temple, the signs being written in Korean, characters going for bibimbap instead of pizza, and nods to Korean culture like K-pop groups and esports. But overall, the city lacks any personality to make it memorable as a setting. It feels like a standard futuristic city with a Korean coat of paint. The city also lacked interesting things to do. Many of the activities had a tendency to be repetitive and the tasks soon felt like busy work and padding. Adding frustration to this is that areas that were cleared previously could suddenly be retaken by the villains, forcing the player to redo the tasks in that area. It also lacked meaningful rewards. The crystals were a great incentive to explore the world since they can augment one of your agents in a significant way, but crafting felt unnecessary since you were never lacking in materials. The only missions that are worth completing are the infiltration missions since they grant Legion Tech blueprints, which could be used to customize your character. But as interesting as the procedurally generated bases could be, it started to feel repetitive after a while. Overall, the open world felt very limited. Which begs the question, why was there an open world to begin with? It was established that Legion has a global presence. Mayhem's base, the Ark, was shown to have the ability to teleport around the world. So why was the conflict being contained to one location? Given the game's Saturday morning cartoon vibe, the fighting should have been happening in exotic locations throughout the world, rather than one city that seems to have an abundance of secret layers. 
Many of these features were obviously created to make gameplay similar to Saints Row. Unfortunately, they just do not match. One of the game's mission types has you invading a Legion-occupied tower to disable it and repurpose the assets. This is done by completing secondary objectives like hacking some terminals or destroying some equipment. The tower is heavily guarded so it seems logical to take out the enemies so that you can complete the objectives without interruption. However, the game has a wanted feature implemented and taking out enemies causes it to spawn more powerful enemies. This makes fighting the enemies pointless and counterintuitive since enemies will not stop spawning. As such, the best strategy for these missions is to have Jewel's turret distract all the enemies while Jewel completes the objectives. Considering that combat is one of the game's strengths, it seems like a misstep to have a system where the best option is to avoid combat. So those are the things that Agents of Mayhem got wrong. But what did it get right? One of the game's strengths is the colorful cast of larger-than-life characters you get to play around with. They all have unique weapons, powers, and designs that help them to stand out. The introduction to each character is memorable and shows that the developers put a lot of love and work into each character. They did a live stream to introduce each of the characters along with the VA. It is easy to find your favorite amongst the roster. Each one of them is charming in their own way and adds something to the story. Whether it is Hollywood's massive ego, Rama's tunnel vision, Yeti's sophistication, Oni's quiet professionalism, or Daisy being Daisy, it is just fun getting to know these characters and watching them play off each other. A pleasant surprise for this game was how layered the characters actually were. The game had moments of environmental storytelling and the characters had some unexpected depth. Braddock wants to pursue a future with Friday but knows that the chains of her past will always stop her from moving forward. Daisy is using recklessness and violence as a way of running away from her problems and her emotions. Many of the characters have clear motivations for why they join the organization. Some have personal vendettas, some are seeking structure and purpose, some have their own agendas, and others are interested in personal glory. Persephone Brimstone is definitely one of the more interesting characters of the game. Originally coming from the organization wrecking havoc on the world, she now dedicates herself to stopping them after she realized what they were really doing. However, she refuses to be framed as a hero in any way. She is clear about her objectives, but whether she is driven by guilt, fear, or something else remains a mystery. Instead of being some philanthropic benefactor or charismatic radical, she pursues her objectives regardless of the cost. In her own words, Please, they all know I used to work for the Morning Star. At best with me, it is a case of bad versus evil. The formation of the teams was an interesting subplot and surprising source of character development. We see Hollywood promoting the team name as a form of marketing campaign for the organization. While this does demonstrate his inflated self-importance, it does show some of his business savvy. Fortune's reluctance of the team is tied to her belief that promoting their efforts might be undercutting the efforts of the rest of Mayhem. She is wary about farming the team since she is in good relations with most of the members. The team mission is the culmination of their character arcs where they help out Hollywood with a ridiculous problem and have an equally hilarious response to it. However, this only really applies to Franchise Force as the rest of the team seem to be an afterthought. There is no explanation for why Jewel and Redcard want to help Rama find a cure for the Mumbai Plague. This is a shame because connecting two other characters to the Mumbai Plague could have given them a goal to strive for together and a reason for these characters to let someone into their lives. The same thing applies for Yeti, Daisy, and Braddock. Nothing seems to be connecting them. The only thing that brings them together is the fact that they all hate Legion and they were available. There could have been more foreshadowing in the personal missions of each character, which could have been character arcs that concluded in the formation of the team. Firing Squad has the best team mission. Their story takes on a Rashomon vibe as each of the members have their own interpretations of the events of the mission, painting three very different pictures. It is a shame that their formation literally comes out of nowhere. While many of the missions boil down to kill some dudes, there are many missions that have interesting twists to them. Red Aisha going through the five stages of grief where each stage is an actual stage was a fun fight. Daisy's introduction mission where she is trying to piece together the events of the night before harkens to the movie The Hangover, where each memory is more absurd and hilarious than the last. The way Oni narrates in his mission gives it a very classic Yakuza film vibe, which is a shame that the mission itself was fairly generic. 
While the open world may have been forgettable, specific missions added creative twists to shake up the gameplay. The developers could have just focused on the missions as they seem to have a lot of creative ideas. Instead of placing the missions in an open world, they could have removed the open world and given each mission its own unique map and gimmicks. Removing the open world could have allowed the missions to be set anywhere in the world and would have contributed a lot to the world building as well. It would have been great to see the plague-crippled Mumbai that haunts Rama, or the Legion-controlled Britain that fills Friday with shame. An underrated aspect of the game was the customization options. Each character had a handful of options, altering their power, weapon, and combat abilities, which could drastically alter their playstyle. Braddock could be a heavy artillery or a cover breaker. Redcard could be a short-range bomb or a single-target demolisher. Hardtack could change his harpoon to teleport enemies away from him and explode, giving him a way to deal with groups of enemies from afar. Some powers were better than others, but there were dozens of meaningful choices to be made with each character, and the game provided opportunities to really make them your own, which is a shame you couldn't share it with anyone. When the game was first revealed, the Overwatch vibe gave the impression of a multiplayer game. Volition has been very transparent that the game will not have multiplayer, which disappointed some fans. It seemed like a fun little game where you could pick your favorites and wreak havoc with a buddy. Just Cause has proven that multiplayer in an open world can lead to some hilarious madness. However, Agents of Mayhem should not have been trying to be an open world game like Saints Row. Agents of Mayhem should have embraced its Saturday morning cartoon inspirations and been more like Marvel Ultimate Alliance. This series was a blast to play multiplayer as you and up to three other friends could choose your favorite in a roster of iconic superheroes and blow stuff up. Despite having a huge roster, everyone played differently. Soon enough, you and your friends would find your favorites while figuring out ways to work together. While everyone could cause mayhem on their own, there was a potential for combos to be created, which is the theme of the second game. Creating combos seems to be something that Agents of Mayhem was built in mind. Some characters can stun and crowd control while others are great at area damage. But since you only control one character at a time, stringing these combos can be tricky and limit the characters. For example, Scheherazade's Gravity Dagger seems to be a great setup power, but swapping to another character to capitalize on this combo can be problematic. As such, it was more practical to use her other abilities instead. While landing crazy combos is possible, it would be more memorable if you could do this with a friend. In Marvel Ultimate Alliance, you could play through the entire campaign on single player or co-op. Considering the market for hero shooters is as saturated as the MOBA market was a few years ago, it is important for games to offer a different experience. Co-op campaign is a market that is criminally underserved in the current gaming market. Resident Evil 6, while highly divisive among fans, still sold very well. Some analysts speculate that the co-op campaign could have contributed to the game's financial success. Co-op campaign was a standard feature of the Halo series before it was discontinued in Halo 5, much to the disappointment of fans. Dead Space 3 is often described as a bad Dead Space game, but a fantastic co-op game. Adding a co-op campaign could have been a way for Agents of Mayhem to stand out. With Volition losing money to the game, it is doubtful if they will return to the IP. This is a shame as the game had some fun interesting ideas. It also featured a world I was curious to explore and characters I wanted to follow. In the middle of all the explosions and crude humor, there were very human characters. If the game was allowed to step out of Saints Row's shadow and form its own identity, perhaps it could have grabbed an audience of its own. I hope we can revisit the world of Agents of Mayhem, but I won't be surprised otherwise. Thanks for watching. To those who play this game, who would you say is your favorite? My main agent was definitely Red Card. Not only was he diverse in his kit, but he was just hilarious to play. He is someone who gives either 0% or 150% in anything he does. More than that, he is a German stereotype we don't see too often. German characters are often portrayed as either excessively prim, proper, rigid, and organized, or villainous pseudo-Nazis. We often forget that Germans are just like the rest of Europe, fun-loving people who really like football. So it was just refreshing to see a different take on a German character. Let me know who your favorite is, I'd love to know. Until our paths cross again, see you agent.